Welcome again guys as we seek to explore another topic in your world of physics. In this segment, we'll be looking at the topic types of errors in measurement. And the objective that will be covered in this topic is to discuss the possible types and sources of errors in measurement. Now, this topic will actually lay the foundation for your experimental skills. So let us go right ahead and explore. Now, what are errors? An error is actually the difference between the true value of a quantity and the measured value of a quantity. So let us highlight the terms true value and measured value. Now, what is meant by the true value of a quantity? The true value is actually the exact value of that particular quantity. For example, we know that the true value of boiling point for pure water is actually 100 degrees Celsius. That is the true value. However, during experiment, the measured value might fluctuate and you would possibly get 98 degrees Celsius, 97 degrees Celsius, or a variety of different measurements. Now, this variation in measurement can be due to a number of factors. For example, the variation could actually be due to something being wrong with the equipment itself, or it could be due to poor manipulation skills of the experimenter, or it could even be due to some environmental factors. So for that we say experimentally an error may be due to either the apparatus, the experimenter, or some environmental factors, for example, humidity, temperature fluctuations, or wind. Now these three sources actually fall under the category of two main types of errors. So let us go and investigate those two main types of errors. Now the first main type of error is the systematic error. And this error has something to do with the system itself. So it says that if the error is due to the apparatus or the system or equipment, we say that it has a systematic error. Now note, the word systematic has the root word system. So that is a good way to recall that the systematic errors is actually associated with something being wrong with the system itself. Now for systematic errors, we have two main categories as well. And those two main categories are the zero error and we have calibration errors. So we will now look at the zero error and the calibration error to see what those are all about. Now the first type of systematic error as we mentioned is the zero error. And this error is when the equipment scale is not at zero before you begin to take your measurement. So if you look at this illustration here, it is obvious that we have a zero error. Because on our scale, this is our zero position. And with nothing being measured, we notice that our pointer is actually below zero. So this is a typical zero error on an equipment. And remember, we're looking at systematic errors. So it has to do with something being wrong with the equipment itself. Now there are actually two types of zero errors. We have positive zero error and we have negative zero error. So let us look at those two types of zero errors. So we say that a zero error may be above or below zero. And the one we saw in our previous illustration was actually below zero, but it can also be above zero. If the zero error is above zero, it is called a positive zero error. So above zero is known as a positive zero error. And if the zero error is below zero, it is called a negative zero error. So that is represented here on our diagram, which is showing us the scale of a micrometer screw gauge. And here on the first diagram, we notice that there is no zero error because we notice that our pointer here, which is the zero line, is actually lined up with the zero position on the scale. Now, here we see that we have a positive zero error because the zero here, which is actually our reference line, so we could refer to this as our pointer, this is actually lined up to a point which is above zero. Here we have our pointer, which is our reference line, being lined up to a point which is 
below zero. So that gives us negative zero error. And that is quite easy to remember as well because we know that below zero is negative and above zero is positive. And these definitions are very, very easy to remember because their names actually help to define them. For example, zero error has to do with a measurement that is above or below zero before you actually start to measure your quantity. Systematic error has to do with the system. So we can actually use the words in our terms to actually define our terms. So let us go now and look at our second type of systematic error. So our second type of systematic error is called calibration error. And as the name suggests, this has to do with the calibration of the equipment. So this type of systematic error is due to incorrect calibration of the equipment itself. Therefore, the instrument does not reflect the true value of the quantity being measured. Now, calibration error might actually be due to manufacturing flaw from the factory itself or can be due to the defects from being worn or rusted over a number of years. For example, if we take a spring balance into consideration, over a number of years, the spring in the spring balance could possibly become rusted. Now, this rusting could actually affect the integrity of the spring itself. And this would mean that the scale itself would no longer reflect the true value of the stretching ability of the spring itself. So it would probably lose its proportionality and that would cause calibration error in the system. So for this reason, it is always safe and good to actually test the calibration of your equipment before. For example, for the spring balance, before you actually use it for a measurement, it is always safe to get a known weight, for example, a one Newton weight, and hang that on your spring balance and actually measure it to ensure that it is giving you a true reading. Then you can go ahead and use your spring balance to measure your unknown weight. Now, similarly, calibration error can also affect digital equipment. And this may be caused from electrical short circuits or some other electrical malfunction or for other various reasons. Also, it could be due to manufacturing flaw, as we said before. So that is what calibration error entails. So we have now covered the two types of systematic errors, which are zero errors and calibration error. So let us move on now to look at the other main type of error. Now, our other main type of error is termed random error. Now, random errors in experimental measurements are caused by unknown or unpredictable changes in the experiment. And these errors are usually due to the experimental or environmental factors. The two main types of random errors are parallax error and reaction error. So let us just backtrack a little bit and remind you, remember for systematic error, the two main types we looked at were zero errors and calibration errors. Now our main heading is random errors and our two types of random errors are parallax error and reaction error. And we'll see how these two actually relate to the experimental and environmental factors. So let us look at the first type, which is parallax error. And the word parallax actually relates to the word parallel. And we already know that when two lines are parallel, it means that they run beside each other, but the distance between them are the same, so they will never intersect, right? So just reminding you. Now, how does that relate to taking a measurement? Now, if you look at these three eye levels of this experimenter taking a measurement from this measuring cylinder, you will notice that this particular line here is not parallel to the lines on the scale. Neither is this particular line here. However, this particular line in the center right here is actually parallel. So we see it runs parallel to the scale lines as well. So when we have parallax error, it is when your line of vision is actually not parallel to the scale and the level of whatever quantity you are measuring. So this is the essence of what parallax error is about. And to reduce or minimize parallax error, it is important that the proper eye level is maintained when measurements are being taken. And remember, the proper eye level is 
the eye level which allows your line of sight to be parallel with the scale readings and also in line with the quantity that is being measured. So now that we have a practical understanding of what parallax error is, let us go back to our definition to see if we can make any sense of it. And here we have parallax error is due to the apparent movement. So let us underline apparent movement of the scale of an instrument as the line of vision of the experimenter changes. Now that sounds like a lot, but let us use our practical knowledge here to apply to this definition. Now remember we said that for this particular reading right here, this would provide no parallax error because our line of vision is parallel to the scale and is also in line with the measurement of the quantity being taken. Now, if you move your eye level upwards, then the scale is going to appear to move relative to where your eye level was before. So this will actually cause you to see a reading that is higher than the actual reading. So you would possibly be seeing a reading somewhere up here on the scale instead of where it should be right here. So that is what we mean by the apparent movement of the scale when your line of vision actually change. And the same thing applies down here. If you were to move your eye level downwards, then the scale itself would appear to move relative to your eye position before. And that would cause the reading to appear to be less than it actually is. So that is what we mean by the apparent movement of the scale when the line of vision changes. Now, some instruments are actually designed in such a way to actually minimize or prevent the effects of parallax error. For example, this particular equipment here has a mirror on the back of the scale. Now, what the mirror does is provide a reflection of the pointer. So this is our actual pointer right here. And what we are seeing here is a reflection in the mirror of the pointer. Now, in order to prevent parallax error, you have to ensure that you are not seeing the reflection. So when your line of vision is in the correct position, then the pointer would be directly above the reflection. So it would be overlaying on the reflection. So that represents when you have no parallax. If you are seeing the reflection, then it means that you are actually having parallax error. So this is a pretty nice design to help us to prevent or minimize parallax error. So before we progress, let us do a quick review of where we are so far so you guys don't lose track. So we said that we have two main types of errors and those two main types are the systematic error and we have random errors. And under systematic errors, we looked at two types, the zero error and we looked at the calibration error. And under random error, we already looked at the parallax error. And at this point, you should ensure that you have a full understanding of all the types that we have done so far. Now we have one more type of error to look at, and that type falls under random error, and that is known as the reaction error. So let us go ahead and look at reaction error. Here we see that reaction error is due to the reaction time of the experimenter in taking measurements associated with time. So reaction goes with time. So usually when you're doing any form of experiments or investigation that has to do with timing, that is where reaction error normally takes its effect. Now, this is due to the reaction time. Let us underline that the reaction time of the experimenter. And we know that the reaction time might vary from person to person depending on your reflex because reaction time is dependent on a person's individual reflex action basically. But the usual reaction time for the average person is 0.2 seconds. It is also proven that the reaction time of a person is less when you are timing a body that is moving faster than it is when you are timing a slow moving body. And that is actually due to a mind factor. So if you are taking the time for a car that is speeding by, your body is naturally going to react faster than it would if you are taking the time for a slow runner. So the faster the body is moving, the less this reaction time will actually be. 
And in experiment, we actually use this effect to ensure that we get more accuracy. For example, when you're taking the period of a pendulum, usually we encourage that you allow the pendulum to swing before you actually start to take the time. Because once the pendulum is in motion, then you actually decrease your reaction time. Because in time in a body that is moving faster, you would actually get a reduced reaction time. Now, another effective way to reduce the reaction time or the error due to reaction time is to actually time the swing of the pendulum for a number of oscillations instead of one. Now, let us see how that actually reduces the effect of reaction time. Now, remember that in time in a pendulum for a single swing, we would actually have a start time for your stopwatch and then you would have a stop time. So, we'd have two reaction times. 0.2 seconds for starting the pendulum and an additional 0.2 seconds for stopping that pendulum. So in addition, we would have 0.4 seconds to contend with for our reaction time. So let us say that the actual period of the pendulum is one second. Then we would actually get one second plus 0.4 seconds for reaction time. So we'd end up with 1.4 seconds. However, if we time the same pendulum for 20 swings, this is what we would get. We would still have the 0.2 for a start and the 0.2 for our stop time. But if we time our pendulum for 20 swings, and since the period is actually one second, that would give us 20 seconds plus 0.4, and that would be 20.4 seconds. But since we want to find the period, we'd actually divide this by 20 and we would actually get 1.02 seconds. Now you see how timing it for a number of swings can actually help to reduce the reaction time error. Because when you do it for one swing, we actually got 1.4 seconds. For 20 swings, we got 1.02, which is actually closer to the actual period of the pendulum. So those are some ways you can actually minimize your reaction error. Now another source of error are those due to environmental factors such as temperature fluctuations, humidity and wind. And the effects of such errors are sometimes unpredictable. However, these can be minimized by actually observing environmental factors before you take your measurements. And depending on if these factors can actually affect your experiment, then you will make a decision whether or not to go ahead with your experiment or to wait it out. And as we discussed before, systematic errors may be reduced by checking and making adjustments for zero errors and calibration errors before taking your measurements. Now, most equipment actually has an adjustment knob so you can actually adjust your zero position. So you can actually eliminate your zero error before you take a measurement. Now, taking the averages actually do not reduce systematic errors due to zero errors and calibration errors. This is so because if the measurement is continuously wrong, then taking the average will not minimize or reduce that error. The value would still be incorrect. Now, random errors may be reduced by taking the average or mean value of a series of measurements or learning to read the instrument properly, as in the case with avoiding parallax errors, or using more than one technique to measurement. So this basically concludes our topic on types of errors. And when we go to our next topic, you can see how this can be applied to the instruments, because our next topic will be actually looking at use of instruments. So see you guys then.